Episode 5 from the fifth chapter of my number one best-selling book on Amazon, How to Become a Barnabas Leader. The Testimony of Bill Myers, a true-life mob story with a happy ending. It was in Atlanta that I first met Bill Myers at the offices of NFL Hall of Fame quarterback Fran Tarkenton on the 33rd floor of an office building in Buckhead. Bill and I had been both contracted with Tarkenton Financial in the retirement insurance business. On the first Monday morning of each month, Bill coordinated a conference call for a handful of Tarkenton agents who are Christians for a short Bible devotional and time of prayer. Fran and his son Matt graciously supported this group. One day, Bill handed me a CD recording of his testimony about how he came to believe in Jesus Christ. This true story is so spectacular that I got Bill's permission to burn several copies onto CDs and handed them out. He once again graciously granted me permission to share his story here in this book. Here below is Bill's amazing story in his own words. It's a testimony, and a testimony is uh, like when you're in a court of law and you uh, swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And this is my testimony regarding what Jesus Christ did in my life. I was born and raised in the Bronx in New York City, uh, the oldest of four boys. My father was a Jewish man, but he was not religious. He told my mom she could raise us however she wanted, and my mom was an Italian lady, and her religion was Roman Catholic, and that's how she raised us. Kind of made me a Juwapi, I guess you could say. I, uh, as an infant, was baptized. At the age of eight, had my first Holy Communion. And at the age of 12, I received my confirmation. And that was the basis of my religious experience. I went to church faithfully. Uh, every Wednesday, I would be released uh, from school a little early to go to religious instruction. And uh, that was basically uh, my experience until I was old enough to not have to go to church anymore. And then it would become a a thing of, you know, Christmas Eve, Midnight Mass, that type of thing, and that was it. My father um, was, was a working man. Uh, we had a normal existence. I was, I was in the Little League. I was in the, the Cub Scouts. And for all intents and purposes, I had a normal life. At one point, I'd say I was around 13 years old or so, my dad decided that he was going to move us out of the Bronx in the neighborhood we were living, things were starting to get rough around that time. A lot of people were starting to use different drugs, although I was kind of clueless about that uh, in terms of what the specifics. He decided he was going to move us to a place called Yonkers, New York, and that's what we did. And life continued on. By this time now, I was approaching, say, around 15 years old. It was the mid-60s in this country and in the whole Western world. The hippie phenomenon was starting to take root. And everybody was doing everything that all the groups did. Uh, the, the popular bands at the time, and it sounds a little corny even to hear myself say it now, but groups like The Who and The Rolling Stones and The Beatles, these were the groups that everybody was into. And whatever the groups did, that's what we did. As their hair got longer, so did ours. As their clothing started to change, so did ours. And as the group started experimenting with drugs and getting high, that's what everybody started doing. Everybody except Billy. My friends knew if we'd be driving around in somebody's car and they would pass a joint around, uh, my friends knew not to even pass it to me, not to even waste their time trying to get me to take it, because I wouldn't do it. Peer pressure then was nothing to me, because I had something else in the back of mind. It's called dad pressure. See, I had remembered a, a conversation I had overheard when I was a little kid, maybe about eight years old. We were still living in the Bronx at the time, and this one evening I was sitting on the living room floor watching television. My dad and my Uncle Joe, my mom's brother, were sitting in the kitchen. They were talking, and I, I was not eavesdropping, but all of a sudden they started talking about a man that they, they had known. And my Uncle Joe said to my dad, he said, oh, Willie, didn't you hear? He died. And my dad said, well, how did he die? And my Uncle Joe said, he OD'd on stuff. Now, I'm sitting there as a little eight-year-old, and I promise you I had no clue at all what that meant. Oh, deed, I didn't know what that meant. And stuff, I had no idea. But the next thing I heard sent a chill, and, and to this day, I'll, I'm almost 49 years old as I'm speaking right now. I can still remember it like it was yesterday. I heard my dad lower his voice and, and, and say to my Uncle Joe, if I ever catch my kid messing with that stuff, I'll put him in his grave. 
and I didn't know what it was he was talking about, but all I decided to myself was that this was going to be very detrimental to my health and I wasn't going to get involved with it at all. Well, when you fast forward a few years, now I'm a, a big wise guy, 15 years old, hanging around with my friends. Now I'm real hip to all the stuff that they were talking about. Well, this man that had OD'd, well, that meant overdosed. And the word stuff... Well, back then it had a very specific meaning. It meant heroin. So what had happened was that this man had taken a shot of heroin that was too strong and it killed him. So that's what happened to this fellow. Well, by the time I was uh, old enough to be hanging around with my friends and observing everybody getting high, I started to have in my mind um, all drugs <laughs> lumped into that idea of stuff. Any drug, anything like that. If my old man caught me messing with that stuff, he'd put me in my grave. Now... I didn't actually think that that meant my father would literally kill me. But my dad was the kind of person that he never spoke uh, with an empty threat. I could count maybe on, on the fingers on one hand and still have some left over the times that I, that I got a beating from him. I, 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 would, I remember them. They were so few, but they were so very specific. He was a tough guy. He had been raised in the Lower East Side of New York. And I wasn't willing to try to find out to what extent he was serious about this, this drug stuff. So it was a non-issue for me. If you would have looked at me hanging around with my friends, you would have thought I was part of the crowd. You would have thought I was a hippie, druggy. I mean, I looked like them, and I hung out with them, and I wore the stuff they wore, but I didn't touch the stuff. That changed. One day in March of 1968, I was a sophomore in high school, 16 years old. Came home from school this day, and I noticed that my mom was very upset. I asked her what was wrong, and she told me that my dad had not called home at his lunch hour. My dad had a habit of every day at lunch, he would just take a minute and pick up the phone and call my mom and say hello. This one particular day, he hadn't done that. With uh, the amount of concern or interest that uh, the average 16-year-old would probably have, I, I told her, hey, it's no big deal, no problem, he'll be home for dinner. Because my dad, you could set your watch by his arrival at home. Well, dinner time came and went. He didn't show up. About 9 o'clock that night, I stood looking out the front window into the driveway. And I didn't want to let my mom know that I was starting to get worried, but I was. And right about that time, this big black sedan pulled into the driveway. These three men got out, large individuals in my memory. They all had trench coats and these hats. It looked like a scene out of some old grade B Hollywood detective movie. They came to the door and identified themselves as FBI agents. We let them in. They started questioning my mom, firing these questions at her. Where was your husband going this morning when he left? What was he wearing? What was he driving? Was he meeting anyone? Just peppering her with all these questions. And my, my poor mom was trying her best to answer, and every now and then she'd ask them what had happened, and they weren't telling her. So finally she said, I demand to know. I'm not going to answer anything else unless you tell me what happened. And I remember distinctly one of the three FBI agents who, who really seemed to be enjoying his job. He just blurted out with no compassion whatsoever in his voice, Well, Mrs. Myers, there was a man this morning shot and killed trying to hold up a bank, and we think it was your husband. Well, in the space of a split second, my entire life just changed completely forever. And the only way you could understand how, how traumatic and how shocking a thing that is is if you, as you're listening to this, are a person who at some point in your life has, a, has experienced the total... Uh, irretrievable, unexpected loss of the most important person in your life. If you haven't experienced that, I could talk from now till the cows come home and nothing I could say will help you experientially feel that. You might feel pity as you hear this story, you might feel sympathy, but you can't really know how devastating a loss that is unless it's happened to you. My entire life, I was 16 years old, all my friends, their dads were just starting to take them out driving, teach them how to drive, go in places with them, doing things. And now that was going to change for me. I remember at the funeral, 
walking around and seeing my uncles uh, in little huddled groups of conversation. On my mother's side of the family, there were a number of her relatives who um, were mob-associated, let me put it that way, in the New York City area. And they were having these little conversations, and every time I'd go over, they would change the subject and start talking about the weather or sports or something. And finally, I went over to one of my uncles and got right in their face and kind of said, you tell me what's going on. I want to know now. And it turns out that... uh, My father, although he had a regular job and was a good family man, he had uh, piled up tens of thousands of dollars of gambling debts. And there was a man, a family friend who worked with my dad, who happened to be in the warehouse one day, the Wednesday prior to the Friday on which my dad died. And this man happened to be in the warehouse, and he was on the other side of a row of bins, and nobody knew he was there when these, these two guys visited my dad. And they were representatives of the uh, loan shark that my dad owed money to. And supposedly they told my dad that he had to pay by Friday. And when he told them that he couldn't raise that kind of money by Friday, such a short notice, they told him, we, well, we know of a bank that you could hit. And when my dad tried to tell them that he couldn't take that chance, they told him that, well, then they'd have to visit his kids on their way to school. And my dad as it was explained to me, being the kind of man who knew that the people he was dealing with did not make empty threats like that, decided he had to take that chance, and he did that Friday morning. He left. I remember saying goodbye to him, and that's the last time I saw my dad. Alive. At the house after the funeral, people came over to the house, and they were sitting in little pockets having coffee and and talking, and I was kind of half in a dreamlike state and half conscious, kind of just walking around the house seeing all these little conversations. And I would pick up snatches of, of conversations and people would be talking about my mom, whose name was Camille. Oh, what a tragedy this is, they were saying. Oh, poor Camille. But then somebody else would say, yes, but at least she has Billy. Billy will help her. <laughs> well... Guess what happened the next time I was in the car with my friends and, the, and they passed around the joint? As it was bypassing me, I said, hey, let me have some. I had wanted to do it all along. I don't pretend for a second that I was some good kid and, and I thought, drugs are bad, you shouldn't do that. No way. I had wanted all along to be doing everything my friends were doing, including getting high, but dad was the one factor that kept me uh, away from using it. Now with him gone, I knew there'd be nobody to stop me. I knew my mother couldn't or wouldn't. And I started getting high, and within six months' time, it's probably a record time, within six months I was uh, a full-fledged mainline heroin addict. And very quickly in those days w- when heroin was costing $2 a bag in Harlem, uh, my habit got up to 100 sometimes $150 a day. And let me tell you that a 16-year-old does not raise that kind of money by mowing lawns or raking leaves or delivering newspaper or shoveling somebody's sidewalk. So I resorted to a, a life of criminal activity. I did whatever I had to do to get money to get my drugs. I was totally hooked. Along the way, my mother eventually found out I was using drugs and she tried to help me, she tried to get me in methadone programs, but nothing really worked. About, I don't know, about three years or so after my dad died, my mom went to a doctor. She was not feeling well. They told her she had colitis, and then a couple months later, they told her she had something called plasma cell myeloma, which at that time was the rarest form of leukemia known to man with the lowest rate of remission that they knew of. And they told my mom she had six months to live. Well, she defied them, or proved them wrong, rather, and she lasted almost five years. And in 1976, my mom succumbed to leukemia. So even though I was not no longer in my teens, necessarily, I was an orphan. And I was still getting high uh, along the way from when my dad died and when I started getting high, to the time the Lord saved me, 
During that 12-year run, I got arrested 11 times along the way. A couple of them were felony arrests. And it's just a miracle of God that I can say right now today I have no criminal record, no police record. It's just an amazing uh, story. That's, uh, that's a discussion in and of itself. But here's what happened directly uh, when, when I started getting uh, uh, real close to the path to being saved. It was July of 1981. I remember it very clearly. It was a very hot, sticky July evening. I was in a diner in South Yonkers called the Parkside Diner. I was waiting to go meet a friend of mine whose name was Carlos, and we had an armed robbery planned. One of my brothers, who by now all three brothers had followed me into drug addiction and criminal activity, one of my three brothers was uh, involved uh, in, a, in a peripheral sense with the mob in the Bronx. And he had fingered for me an illegal card game. Let me just take a moment and explain what that means because uh, someone listening to this might not be familiar with that terminology. When you were going to pull a stick up back in those days, you either targeted a drug dealer or a gambling den because those folks tended not to call the police when they got robbed, you know. I mean, uh, uh, somebody running an illegal card game would not call up the police and go, hey, we was robbed, <laughs> you know. And then the police would say, well, what were you doing with all that money? Oh, well, we was, uh, never mind, <laughs> you know, click. And so they just didn't call the cops. Well, my brother had fingered this game for us. We knew where it was. We knew the password. You actually needed, uh, it sounds corny, it sounds like something out of the movies, but it really was how it happened. You knocked on the front door, and somebody slid back a little peephole, and you identified yourself with a password, and they let you in. My brother had fingered this one particular card game for us. We knew how much money roughly would be on the tables as the men in there, mostly mob guys, were gambling. We had the password. My friend Carlos had the pistols, and the whole thing was set up. We knew roughly how much we were going to get. We had a group of uh, drug dealers waiting for us in the Bronx, and they were going to sell us a package of cocaine. And we had another crew of guys in New Jersey who were waiting to buy that package of coke from us at a very handsome profit. So the whole deal was set up this one evening. I was in the Parkside Diner, and I left to go meet Carlos, and I, I remember it again like it was yesterday, putting out my cigarette on the sidewalk, and I started to turn to my left to walk down the road to meet him when I heard noise coming from my right side, coming from this park that was next to the diner. You see, the diner was the park side diner, right? It was built alongside a park. Very witty uh, <laughs> thought process in naming the diner there. So I, I thought I had a, a few minutes to kill. I walked down the sidewalk and I looked into this park. And the thing that struck me, actually two things. First of all, over to the right side of the park was the kind of people that I had seen there th I don't know, hundreds of times as I walked by that park, as I drove by that park. People hanging out, drinking wine from a paper sack, smoking pot, playing cards, playing radio. Regular kind of park people. But that's not the noise that distracted me. A little further down the sidewalk, over to the left side of the park, was a group of people that stood out like a sore thumb. They were dressed very neatly. The men had ties on. The ladies had dresses on. They, they stood out like a sore thumb. And they were all holding these red books, and they were singing. Uh, what it finally dawned on me was some kind of religious church song. So I'm looking at this group and figuring out in my mind that for some reason here was a group that had nothing better to do than to do their church service out in the park. Well, that's what it was. Now my curiosity was satisfied and I turned to leave. And just as I turned to leave, the singing stopped and they all sat down. And this little old guy with the group got up on this little makeshift kind of pulpit and he started preaching to the people in the park. And I'm standing on the sidewalk looking at this man who was a little off to my left and ahead of me, preaching, and then turning my eyes kind of like when you're on the sidelines at the tennis court, looking over to the right at the other end of the court. And here was this group of people in the park doing their thing, smoking pot, drinking wine, playing the radio, playing cards, totally oblivious to the existence of this man. And I was looking back and forth, and it was as if there was a, a gigantic brick wall 
between him and them. There was not one single solitary soul paying any attention to him. And in my heart, in my mind, I was laughing at him. I was mocking him. Look at this jerk. Look at this fool. Doesn't this idiot realize that there's not one person paying attention to him? So what did I do? <laughs> I felt sorry for the old guy. Now, if you knew the Bill Myers of that day, you would know that that in and of itself was an extremely strange occurrence because I had no pity for nobody, for, for no one in those days. If I was on my way to get money for, for drugs, no one got in my way. And when people did, they got hurt. That's not uh, a bragging statement. That's, that's a, a, a testimony of, of fact. And if I already had the money in my pocket and was on my way to get the drugs, or if I already had the drugs, I was on my way to shoot up, you certainly didn't stop me then. So I had zero compassion for people. Yet for some strange reason, I felt sorry for this, this old guy. And I said to myself, you know, I have a few minutes to kill. If I just go in and sit down on the bench in front of this guy and pretend as if I'm listening, then at least this much will be true. If someone else walked by and looked in, they wouldn't laugh at him. It would appear as if he had an audience. And I tell you, that's the only thing that compelled me to go in there. I could have cared less. If, if my life depended on it right now today, I couldn't tell you what he was preaching about. But I did that. I, I went in and I sat down on the bench and I was listening to him. So there I am sitting on a bench and, and all of a sudden this, this young guy who was with this church crowd, but he looked a little different. I mean, he had a little bit longish kind of hair, almost shoulder length. And he looked, you know, like a normal guy. Though, and he came over and he stood right over me, put his finger in my face, which <laughs> if you knew me in those days was a very dangerous thing to do. And he said, you're Bill Myers, aren't you? And I looked up this kid. I didn't know him from Adam. I didn't even know Adam at the time, right? So I said, I, I don't know you. He says, yeah. He says, yes, you do. I'm Mickey DeCarmine. Well, that name meant as much to me then as it does to you listening to this right now. I said, look, kid, I told you I don't know you. He says, yeah, I went to school with your brother Danny. Well, I have a brother Danny. And I was still not sure who this was because, you know, when you were into my lifestyle, I mean, for all I knew, I could have ripped off this kid's whole family the night before. And here he was, uh, you know, looking for, for Bill Myers. And you just didn't say, yeah, that's me here. Take me away. You know, you just didn't acknowledge your name in public like that. But then he said the thing that really got to me. He said, yes, you, you know my family. He says, my mom's name is Dolores. She's the lady that used to visit your mom in the hospital when she was dying with the leukemia. Well, I had mentioned earlier that my mom did die of leukemia, and now I kind of remembered this guy's family, so I thought it was safe to acknowledge my identity. And I said, yeah, I'm Bill Myers. So he sat down on the bench next to me, and he slapped me on the knee. He said, so how are you doing? And this kid was so bright and bubbly and enthusiastic, he made me sick to my stomach. You know why? Because I tell you, I wanted nothing to do with anybody that was so happy. The Bible is so clear that darkness flees from the light. And it's not just that I was in darkness, I was darkness. The Bible says that to everyone who's a believer. It doesn't just say in Ephesians 5, you were in darkness, now you're in the light. It says you were darkness, now you are the light. Well, I was darkness then, and the light was sitting next to me, and I wanted nothing to do with it. Well, he starts talking to me, and every now and then he'd come back to that question, so how are you doing? And I first tried to fluff him off, and then it dawned on me that, that there was no way to get him to stop, and the only way I was going to get him to shut up was to kind of shock him. I said, you want to know how I'm doing? I'll tell you how I'm doing. And I told him my whole life story, everything that had happened to me, how I had just gotten out of the hospital with the, hep the second time having had hepatitis. And I told him how bad I was doing. And I thought that would kind of shock him and scare him away, but he just sat there grinning, <laughs> you know, grinning that Christian grin at me. And uh, so finally, I asked him, you know, because this kid, I mean, he was normal in the sense he knew my music. We talked about sports. And he just, he believed in this Jesus in a way I had never encountered before. 
And I couldn't reconcile these two thoughts. On the one hand, this man, this young man seemed normal, but on the other hand, he believed in Jesus. So finally, I asked him what he was doing out here with these people, and that's when he got real excited. He jumped off the bench and he said, uh, patting himself on, on the chest, he said, I, I'm a disciple. I said, a disciple? I said, look, Mickey, I don't know much about the Bible, but I know there was only 12 disciples. They all died a long time ago. So what do you mean, this disciple? He said, no, disciples just simply means a follower of Jesus Christ. I said, well, look, you know, if this is something that helps you, if this is good for you, that's fine, you know, but don't shove it down my throat. And, and meanwhile, in the background, you know, the preacher is still going on. He's talking about heaven and hell and God loves you, Jesus loves you. And I said to Mickey, don't shove this down my throat. And he said, well, Bill, he said, I just want you to know that the Lord loves you. And then I snapped. I let him have it with both barrels of the shotgun, with language that I cannot repeat today. Your God loves me, Mickey? Let me ask you a question. Where was your God of love? Where was your blankety-blank God of love when my father was bleeding to death on the floor of that bank? Where was your God of love then, Mick? Tell me about that. Where was your God of love when my mother was in that hospital room in her last days, racked with so much pain, they were giving her so much morphine, she was hallucinating? Where was your God of love then, Mick? Can you tell me about that? Or how about when I'd find myself waking up in some burnout tenement building in Harlem with roaches and rats running around on the floor? Where was your God of love then? And you know, to, to his credit, Mickey was not one of these uh, Christians that felt he had to have all the answers and be able to tie it all up in a neat box. And he looked at me and said, quite honestly, Bill, I don't have all the answers to those questions, but I do know this, that sometimes the Lord lets people get to a situation where they'll finally, uh, you know, hit the bottom of the barrel and they'll be willing to look up to him. I said, well, great, Mick, you know, that's great. If this, if this helps you, then that's fine, but, you know, this is enough for me. And, you know, this was a Wednesday night, and, and he said to me as I was trying to get up to leave, he said, listen, wh why don't you come to the meeting on Sunday morning? And I said, well, my car's not working. He said, I'll pick you up. I said, well, I don't think I have anything appropriate to wear. He said, look, what you have on is fine. Just say you'll go. I said, okay, sure. Never dreaming in a million years that he would show up in my neighborhood on a Sunday morning to pick me up for church, quote, unquote. But, but he did. I remember being in the car with him on the way to a place called Bethany Chapel in Yonkers, New York. <clears throat> I remember thinking to myself, I didn't even have a dime in my pocket. I didn't know where I was going to have lunch that day. I had already tapped out every eating establishment in my neighborhood. I had bummed a meal off every place, the pizza place, the Chinese food place, every place. There was no place I could show my face and say, hey, Joe, give me a slice and I'll pay you Friday. Nothing. Had no money. We go to a place called Bethany Chapel, and as we walk in, I remember just because of my religious upbringing, which I've already mentioned, my right hand fingers starting to curl into dip position. And what this means, for those of you that might not be familiar with this, is that you dip your hand in the holy water and make the sign of the cross when you enter the church. So my hand naturally curled up. I was looking for the holy water, and there wasn't any. And I kind of almost stumbled looking for it. And then I started looking around, and I was kind of, I was slapped in the face by the absence of the familiar. I, I was looking for the familiar sights and sounds, stained glass, uh, statues, candles, incense, smells and sights and sounds. But there was, there was nothing. There was pews, <laughs> uh, a pulpit up front. So I turned to Mickey. I said, Mickey, I thought you said we we're going to church. He said, well, no, actually, he says, we're the church, touching, pointing to himself and others. He says, we're the church. This is just the chapel. I said, what's with this guy? First he's a disciple, now he's the whole church. Not realizing that what he meant was uh, a biblical truth. The church is the people, and we meet in the chapel, and the chapel's just the building. There's nothing holy about the building. I didn't know that then. I asked him if we could sit in the back, the corner seat, last row, corner seat, aisle seat. And he said, well, what do you want to sit back there for? I said, well, I, I lied to him. I said, in case I wanted to go out for a cigarette, I didn't want to, um, you know, in, have to uh, crawl over anybody or, or uh, you know, put anybody out. And the truth was, though, if I felt I wanted to leave in a hurry, for whatever reason, I didn't want anybody between me and the door. So I'm sitting back there in the, what I call now the escape seat. 
And the man was preaching that day. It was not the same man that I had seen in the park. It was a different man. And he was going on and on and on about everything you can mention. Sin and salvation and heaven and hell and Jesus and Satan and, and the cross and the blood. And, and I remember sitting back there in this seat, saying to myself, thinking to myself, you know, giving this man the benefit of the doubt, which just sounds so prideful, that was so big of me to give him the benefit of the doubt. But saying to myself, you know, give this guy the benefit of the doubt. Even if everything he's saying is true, even if it's all true, there's no way in the world that God could forgive a person who has done the kinds of things that I've done in my life. And as I was having that thought, I'm telling you, it, it was like putting a, a video on fast forward on search where all the various scenes, all my fundraising activities over the years, all the things I did to get money for my drugs were flashing through my mind one after another. Horrible scenes. Scenes I don't even repeat when I, when I minister at the, uh, the New Hampshire State Prison once a month, when I talk to some of the toughest inmates in, in, in the country. Scenes that I don't even repeat with those guys. And as I'm sitting back there having these thoughts, the man who was preaching stopped right in the middle of his sermon and he looked out across the audience. He wasn't quite looking at me, but he said these words. My friend... You're sitting here this morning thinking to yourself, you're too bad for God to forgive, but you're wrong, my friend. And I was like, whoa. Man. <laughs> you know, I, uh, the word wow was my whole vocabulary at the time. Wow. <laughs> I can even say it backwards, right? Wow. And, you know, as far as I was concerned, there was no one else in that room. He was talking to Bill Myers. And as quickly as that thought popped into my mind, another court thought came came rushing in and forcing the first thought away. And here was the second thought. Wait a minute. <laughs> I know, these people are pretty slick. They are pretty darn good. I know what they're trying to do. They thought they could fool old Willie boy. Well, they have to get up pretty early in the morning to, to fool somebody as streetwise as, as I am. See, because I was a big con artist. That's Most of the ways I got my money back then was conning people. So I thought now the con was being pulled on me. I know what happened. This kid, Mickey, that met me at the street meeting, obviously he got hold of the preacher somehow during the week and said, look, there's going to be this guy with me Sunday morning. His name's Bill Myers. He's been real bad. He's this big criminal. Don't look at him necessarily, but say something so he'll think Christianity is true and he'll become a Christian. Well, needless to say, that was the birds of the air trying to snatch away the seed that had been planted, but... Nothing could have been further from the truth. There was no collusion. There was no conspiracy. Mickey had never called the preacher and told him I was coming. Nothing like that ever happened. What did happen, imagine this. Here's a radical thought for you. What did happen was the Holy Spirit actually doing what the Bible says he does. Can you imagine that? While on one hand convicting my heart of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment... While he was doing that, he was over there on the other side of the room putting the words that were needed to be said into that preacher's mind and heart. Can you imagine that? Well, the service ended. Mickey introduced me to his mom, <laughs> Dolores, and she said, Oh, I remember you. You were the bad one. <laughs> oh, boy. And he introduced me to his sister, Margie. I remember thinking to myself, she's cute. And he introduced me to his dad, Mike the Carmine, Big Mike. Big, loud, booming voice, big Italian guy. I want you to come home, have lunch with us. I said, lunch, yes. So that's what we did. I went home, had lamb dinner, and that was not planned. She was just having lamb that day. And you know, the problem I had when I met Mickey in the street meeting at the park bench there considering this man to be normal, yet him believing in this Jesus and, and the promise and reconciling those two, well, now it was, it was multiplied by four. Here I, there was a normal father, a, a, a mother, a son and a daughter. They, they did normal things. They had normal interests. They, they were sports fans. The mom was a Mets fan. Uh, yet they believed in this Jesus in such a way that if he had walked into the room at any moment during the conversation, the only one that would have been surprised would have been me. And these people had something. They had something that I no longer had. I never had, really. 
they, there was some bond, there was something there. And it was so attractive, so very attractive. I remember <clears throat> leaving the house that day after late afternoon, the meal was over and I was uh, halfway out the door. And I turned to say goodbye to the family and uh, Big Mike was sitting in his uh, easy chair off in the corner reading the Sunday paper. And he put his newspaper down and he looked across the living room at me and in his sweet little voice he said, I want to ask you a question. I said, sure, Mike, what's that? You get hit by a truck tonight and die, where are you going? And, um, you know, even back in those days, even though I was a drug addict, I still, I had a lot of pride and I, I considered myself a very well-read person and I didn't want to be perceived as somebody who didn't understand the message that had been um, spoken to me that day. So I said, Mike, uh, you know, I went halfway back into the living room. And I said, Mike, you know, I, I want you to understand that. I, I want you to know that I really understand what you told me today. According to what you've told me, if I were to die tonight, I would go to hell. I don't believe that, Mike, but I do understand. And then he did something really interesting. He wiped his hands together. He says, go ahead, take a hike, take a walk. I told you the truth. Now you have to answer to God. Goodbye. And he picked up his newspaper and started reading again. Now, I always tell people I don't recommend that as an evangelistic technique. But in my case, right then and there, that's what was needed, you know? If God, if, if some dear, sweet, little grandmotherly type had been there saying to me, wait, sonny, don't go, I would have been out the door. But here was this big bruiser of a guy telling me, take a hike, buddy. And for some reason, I didn't want to leave without making peace there. And so I went back in the room, and I just kind of smoothed things over. And I left that evening. I had not made any commitment, had not made, made any decision for Christ. They gave me an old Bible to, to read. And the only promise they extracted from me was that the following Wednesday night that I would meet them at the street meeting again. I said I would. Went home, went about my business. I was still getting high. At that point in time, I was doing speed balls. This is what John Belushi, the actor, died from, mixing cocaine and heroin together and shooting that up because that was the only way I would feel the shot on top of the methadone that I was taking. I was on this government clinic every morning drinking methadone, which was supposedly something that was designed to take people off heroin. But as you can hear from my testimony, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily do, do what it was designed to do. So... Wednesday night showed up, and I remembered, hey, I'm supposed to go meet Mickey at the street meeting. So I, I started to leave my rented room, and I remember the Bible they had given me. And I grabbed an old, uh, an old shopping bag from the supermarket, and I cut it up, and I made a, a book cover for the Bible because I didn't want to walk through my neighborhood carrying a Bible. And I got to the street, uh, where the street meeting was, and I saw Mickey across the park, and I saw that his dad was with him, and this really impressed me, that the dad would come out to this thing. And Mickey saw me, and he waved and called my name, and I said, Hi, Mick, and I waved with my right hand, with my left hand holding the Bible down at my side. And I saw Mike, Big Mike, wave, and I noticed his eyes drop down to my other hand. <clears throat> and he saw, <laughs> he saw the covered Bible there, and across the entire park, in his dear, sweet, timid little voice, he boomed out, what are you covering the Bible for? Are you ashamed of the Bible? And I said, shh, no, no. In case it rained, I didn't want it to get wet. <laughs> and it hadn't rained in like, uh, you know, four weeks, but that's what I said anyway. Sat through another message, don't know what I heard, couldn't tell you if my life depended on it. So that was the third message. The first night I met him was a Wednesday night, then I went to, to Bethany Chapel on Sunday morning, and now it was a Wednesday night. And again, they, they tried to share a little more with me, and I still hadn't made any decision, and they got me to agree to come to church again, Bethany Chapel, the second Sunday. And Mickey picked me up, and we went to Bethany Chapel the second Sunday, and after that meeting was over, they told me that they were going to have an impromptu picnic on the campus grounds of a place called King's College in Briarcliff, Man, New York, where I like to go, <laughs> where I like to go, lunch, yes. So we went up to this picnic, and uh, 
as I was getting out of the car, I noticed, uh, I mean, the people were setting up the little tables. They were getting the, the, the charcoals going. They were getting the burgers and the buns out. and Everybody was a beehive of activity setting up here. And I noticed the preacher. Now, this second Sunday that I had been at, at Bethany Chapel was a different preacher than, than it was the first Sunday. And this guy was preaching that particular morning from an Old Testament passage uh, concerning the law that God gave Moses uh, to help the people when they wanted to have someone cleansed from leprosy. And it involved two birds, and you killed one bird, and you dipped the other bird in the blood of the dead bird, and you let it fly away. And I remember having read that passage just that morning. <clears throat> and when the man was preaching from it, I thought I had detected a mistake. So I was going to play uh, one of our favorite game shows, Let's Go Beat Up the Preacher. <laughs> That's right. And I wasn't even a believer yet. So I made my way over to this guy, and uh, his name was Billy Krecker. And I introduced myself, and he was very kind, very patient, and I started pointing out his mistake, and he very kindly and patiently showed me, uh, really, that I didn't know what, what I was talking about, and he showed me th that I was wrong. And um, But halfway through the conversation, he looked at me kind of with a little quizzical look on his face, and he said, have, have you accepted the Lord yet? And I remember saying, well, no, not really. He said, well, why don't you do it right now, here? And I looked around. I said, here in front of all these people? He said, well, if it'll make you feel more comfortable, we can step into the bushes. And the bushes were about two feet off the ground. And it sounds crazy, but I remember stepping into the bushes and feeling more comfortable. And he led me in prayer. He was very careful to explain to me that just the mere repetition of his prayer really had no meaning. It was that... If as I repeated what he was leading me in, in, to pray, as I repeated it, if I understood it and believed it for myself, that's what would make the difference. And that day, July 19th, 1981, the reason I, the date stands out so vividly in my mind is because the next day was my actual birthday, July 20th. July 19th, 1981 was the very first time in my life that I believed in actuality that there is a place called heaven, there is a place called hell, that sin is real, that Jesus Christ died on the cross, and if I trusted in the fact that when he died, he paid all the penalty for me, then when I died, God would take me to heaven. And that is all I knew about the gospel at that point in time. I knew nothing about... If I make this commitment, if I take this step, it's going to mean cutting my hair, stopping this, doing that. None of that was an issue then. It's just that I knew if I were to die that day, I would go to hell, and I didn't want to go there. Didn't want to go there, and I trusted Jesus Christ, and that is the day that I was saved. And in short order, he came into my life, he came into my heart right then and there, but he came into my life and started demonstrating his power and cleaned me up totally. In a short while, I was able to, to kick my entire drug habit. He provided the way for me to go to a Bible college. I went to a four-year Bible college in the Midwest. It was there I met the lady who was uh, to be the future Mrs. Myers. God has given me a beautiful family. He's given me a, a good business and a, and a fantastic preaching ministry. And it's all, it's all of grace. It's all because of his mercy and his grace. And if I were in a court of law right now, this would be my testimony. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You've been listening to the Fresh Start Company podcast with best-selling author and motivational speaker David Henning. Join us again next time for a fresh dose of motivation, inspiration, and encouragement. The Fresh Start Company, helping people like you with fresh ideas for business and personal growth.